Thank you, and, uh, and good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, Puzzle of Planet Mercury, Why Go There? It's not exactly my title, but I agree to go with it. <laughs> it fits with the general theme. And as this is my inaugural lecture, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey that's taken me to the position where I'm going to Mercury, at least with a spacecraft, on which I, I'm not actually a principal investigator. I'm a, a lead co-investigator for geology on this instrument, but it's... Uh, it's much the same kind of thing. But I didn't come here to, uh, to work on other planets. So I, I came here um, in 1978. This was my first contact with the Open University, a letter from Ian Gass in reply to one from me. Ian Gass was the founding professor of Earth Sciences here, and I'd heard about a PhD here using uh, satellites to do mapping in Arabia. And the terrain that was being mapped was part of the ocean floor that had been thrust on top of the edge of the continent. It's called an ophiolite. Ophiolites were quite new and very exciting things to work on in those days. Mick Brown, who's here in the audience, started two years before me. And Ophiolites were really cool. It's a great thing to work on. So this is a letter from Ian. And here's my letter of appointment from uh, the um, Higher Degrees Office, as it was then called, um, saying um, uh, you'll be starting on the 1st of September, 1978. And current PhD students will be interested to note that this letter was sent to me on the 2nd of October, 1978. <laughs> but the Higher Degrees Office has been rebranded multiple times since then, but it, whatever it's called these days, uh, these, you know, it's always been like this. You get your letters too late. <laughs> um, I started early because I was going to be sent off to the Oman in early uh, November, and I had to learn to drive before I got there. But my, the very first thing I did... Thanks to Ian Gass, um, in either July or August, records have been lost. He got me a week's demonstrating at summer school. So I went to a summer, summer school at Durham, met OU students, and it was really that experience that showed me what a remarkable institution the Open University is, spending time with students, going out in the field with them, drinking with them in the evening and so on. And I very much regret that so little of that happens these days because it did make us a community... And students learned off each other and sparked off each other. I know you can do it remotely, but it's, it's better to, to, to meet people for real. So those summer schools were, for me, what showed me what OU <coughs> students were like and really attracted me to the institution. Um, I was going to summer school every year until they, they stopped a few years ago, very largely. A few still happen. What I did after that, I was able to get a postdoc and then lectureships here. I started getting PhD students of my own, and the first bunch were, well, Sasha on the left there was remote sensing of the Oman, doing a better job than I did because she had a better satellite. And the next three guys there uh, were using satellites to monitor active volcanoes on the Earth. And that's what I did for a while. I wasn't headed towards, towards planets like Mercury, but that did come about a little while later. But let me just take you back to the Oman, because um, there's a link between the Oman and what we're doing on Mercury. Here's me in my field area, that's, I think, the sheeted dike complex in the background. It may not look like it, but I am wearing shorts. <laughs> uh, it was a beautiful area. It was arid, the rocks were well exposed, perfect for remote sensing. Um, now, the Oman is this region here. This is the Straits of Hormuz. And we're mapping this area here. This is Ian Gass supervising me in the field with a mug of tea in his hand. He was a Yorkshire man. And this is my Land Rover. What a privilege to be given charge of that Land Rover and told go into the mountains and, and make a map. And I slept in that Land Rover, not with those goats. Uh, it was a great vehicle, except when it broke down or, or got stuck. But I was in amongst the rocks trying to map them. But my project was to see what remote sensing could do. Ian Gass was great at getting money from different sources. And he got money to try out this new fangled Landsat technique. Um, here's a much better modern satellite image than we had in those days. And the old Landsat images weren't a lot of use. What I used mostly was 1 to 60,000 scale RAF black and white air photos flown in the 1950s. It's just enlarge that one up. You can see um, this is a water course here and you can probably make out individual acacia trees and you can see the fabric running through the terrain. That was great and we produced maps. Um, go back to this satellite view of my field area. Two winters, mapping in the field, 
I turned it into a, a geological map. This is by forming the contacts in the field and learning what was what and how it looked in remote sense data. And this is what we now do on other planets. Here's part of the planet Mercury. Jack Wright, who's in the audience, finished a PhD several months ago. And this is a bigger area here than I mapped in the Oman. And this is only part of Jack's area, but he turned that into a geological map on another planet using very much the same techniques as I was using back from 1978 till 1982 during my PhD under Ian Gass's leadership. And we've got quite a team doing planetary mapping here now. Here's my, my present team, basically. Um, if you're a little bit concerned about the, uh, the gender imbalance there, it wasn't always like that. When I started uh, mapping on Mercury, not mapping, started studying Mercury, um, I had three female students. Who, um, <laughs> the one who fancies herself as Cher, Valentina, was the one who spent time working on Photoshop rather than <laughs> mapping. She produced that wonderful graphic. And Mercury has been a very productive a body to do research on. Our spacecraft, which you'll hear about shortly, is on its way there. We've been able to do so much because there's been a NASA mission called Messenger, which provided wonderful data that we've been working on. Okay, now where is Mercury? Here's the solar system, the inner solar system, as it is right now. Um, so here's the Earth, and you can just about see its orbit, and here's Mercury on its orbit. Mercury is going um, clockwise around the sun, anti-clockwise around the sun, sorry. And just on Monday, it passed exactly between the Earth and the sun. How many of you saw it? A lot of people who were here had a chance to see it. We, we had sunshine for most of the transit. Here are people on the Mulberry Lawn and somewhere, oh, I'll put a circle around it. There, just inside that little circle, maybe you can see the tiny little dot of Mercury that's just started transiting across the sun's disk. And when Carol Haswell gives her talk after me, she'll be talking about planets transiting across their stars, usually um, bigger planets and quite often smaller stars, so they're easier to spot. This will be very hard to spot remotely, but that is a planet transiting across the sun. It did dim the sunlight, but the clouds that kept passing by were dimming the sunlight a lot more. So, but Mercury is a hard planet to study from the Earth because it's, it is between the Earth and the Sun. It never strays far from the Sun in the sky. Here's a picture I took of it by leaning my iPhone on the wall of my house in Silverstone. That's Mercury, a pale pink dot in the sky. Um, you can see it if you look in the right place at the right time. So what's it like as a planet? Okay, here's the Earth and Mercury to, to scale. Mercury at the top there, it's an airless body. Fairly colourless. I'll be showing you images with exaggerated colour in a while, but with the unaided eye, it'd be pretty dark and grey. But it's a smaller body than the Earth. Um, it's airless. It doesn't have enough gravity to hang on to an atmosphere, especially at the high temperatures by day that close to the sun. But it's a weird world because it's very dense. It's got the same density as the Earth, which might not, may, not, may not seem remarkable, but it's a much smaller body. So it has much less gravity and therefore much less internal compression. Um, so its density relative to its size means it must have a very large core inside it. And here's what we think Mercury's internal structure is. Um, this is the inner core, which is solid. This is the outer core, which is fluid, molten. That was a big surprise when the Mariner 10 spacecraft got there and discovered that. And then this is the rocky mantle, and this is the rocky crust. And that is a very small amount of rock um, enveloping a large amount of iron and that you have to explain that if you want to want to understand how mercury got to be like it is if we show earth and mercury to the if it's if they're the same size mercury here earth there mercury's um, core is much much more massive much more voluminous th than the earth's and here they are, their actual size is mercury's solid inner core is actually a little bit bigger than the earth's solid inner core in absolute terms the Mercury, if it started out like the Earth with the same ingredients, which you broadly speaking expect, it's lost a lot of its rock. Well, I mean, how did that happen? Um, I don't know how many of you watched the Planet series, the OU BBC co-production that, uh, that I worked on as one of the two OU advisors. You saw graphics showing 
planetary embryos colliding with each other and ripping material away. It didn't really convey um, the story very well, I thought. But the point is, if, if this is Mercury here that's just careened off a body that would later become the Earth or a body that would later become Venus and stripped away most of its rock, you're left with the core surviving that glancing blow, hit and run impact, and a very small amount of rock surviving around it. And that's an easy way to explain big core, small amount of surrounding rock. But um, then when you find out what that rock is like and what it contains, it, it, it doesn't stack up very easily. And I'll come onto that in a moment. So here's what we know about Mercury, some simple facts. These are the terrestrial planets at the correct relative scale. Mercury, Venus, Earth, I'll put the Moon there as well, and Mars. So you see Mercury is smaller than Mars, but bigger than the Moon. But it's, it's relatively dense for its size. And it has a magnetic field, which Mariner 10 discovered. So there's a magnetic field enveloping it. And that's a, a strange thing, because the Earth has a magnetic field, but Venus doesn't, Mars doesn't, the Moon doesn't. A magnetic field is telling you that you've got a, an electrical conducting fluid churning around inside. So that's why we think Mercury's outer core is fluid, like the Earth's outer core is. The, the cores of the other rocky bodies must be solid throughout. Okay, key facts about Mercury. I'll press the button again to make them play. Okay, there's a very large, presumably iron-rich core, which we get from its density. Um, but the surface is only 2% iron. That's a small amount of iron in the rock. All the iron's gone into the core. But there's a lot of sulfur, 2 to 5% sulfur, wherever you look. Sulfur is what we call a volatile element. It's easily lost to space under conditions of high temperature. It's volatile. It doesn't stay at the surface. So um, how can a planet that's had this glancing impact with something else and strip most of its rock still retain a lot of sulfur. Um, there are other volatiles uh, around on the surface. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of chlorine, potassium, sodium, various other substances, and some that we don't know what they are, but are clearly volatile. Mercury is a planet rich in volatiles, which is very hard to reconcile with its violent birth close to the sun. It's, it's got gases surrounding it in space. This is the composition, compositionally rich and variable exosphere. The exosphere changes from dawn to dusk and from poles to the equator. There's a lot going on. It's almost no atmosphere to speak of. The atmospheric pressure is a billion times less than the Earth's, or less than that. But there are atoms around it. And some of these interact with the magnetic field and get ionized. And for me as a geologist, that's how I began, what particularly interests me, apart from the volatile richness, is there's a prolonged history of volcanism and tectonism, tectonism being fault movements. It's a geologically very complex world, which 20-odd um, years ago we wouldn't have expected. So, Bepi Colombo is the European mission that I'm involved in, and um, it, we launched it last year, and it, it made it into the Sunday Telegraph quiz, and uh, so it was a quiz answer. Of course, I mean, if you're foolish enough to believe what the Daily Telegraph reads, uh, what the Daily if you're foolish enough to believe what the Daily Telegraph tells you, you would come away with the impression that Bepi Colombo is a British spacecraft heading to Mercury, but it's not. It's the European Space Agency spacecraft heading to Mercury with one British-led instrument on board. But it's certainly not Cristiano Ronaldo's yacht or a Chihuahua puppy belonging to the President of Colombia. Here's the spacecraft being launched from Kourou in Guyana um, in the middle of the night our time in uh, October last year. And on the left there is me uh, standing beside a, a full-size replica of it, which you can see in the Science Museum. It's a big spacecraft. And how I got involved in it is like so. In 1994, I got a message. Uh, I'm not sure if it would have been an email in those days, saying... Um, we're a group of scientists proposing to the European Space Agency that it's time to send a spacecraft to Mercury because there's only ever been one. It's high time to go again. John Guest, the guy pictured there, is our geologist, but he's ill. Can you go? Can you come with us to Paris? Because we, we know about magnetic fields, but not about geology, and make the geological case for sending a spacecraft to Mercury. So I went and I said my piece, and it 
wasn't a very exciting planet in those days. You, I, I tried to big it up a bit. There were things we didn't know, I wanted to find out, but people would not have thought Mercury as, as, was as exciting as we now think it is. So I made my case to them, and I, I heard no more about it for the next decade, until it, it was approved by ESA in the, about the year 2000. And four years after that, I was asked to be on a panel reviewing the instruments to decide which instrument or instruments the UK could afford to buy into. And that's really when I got involved. Apart from my cameo role in 1994, I got re-involved in, in 2004. And this is the spacecraft we have now, Bepi Colombo. This is its flight configuration. This is how it would look now in space. Um, it's powered by an iron drive. Look, flames here, have not flames, the xenon exhaust is what provides the drive. Powered by solar power from these panels here. And we're on a long cruise to get to Mercury. And on board is the British-led instrument, the one that I was lead scientist on for a while. Um, here, uh, masterminded from Leicester University, which is where I'm posing here. It's an X-ray telescope. Well, it's a, there's two instruments. One on the left is a telescope. Here it is, closer up. This is an X-ray lens to collect the X-rays, and they're, they're collected at the bottom. They're focused onto the focal plane assembly. This is a, a device that uh, uh, collects more X-rays but doesn't focus, and it's a collimator. So we've got twin instruments collecting the X-rays that have come from Mercury. And it's, it's capable of mapping the surface composition in all these elements here. The yellow ones, um, silicon, titanium, aluminium, iron, magnesium, calcium, and sulfur, were mapped crudely by the X-ray spectrometer on MESSENGER, the NASA mission, <coughs> and the ones in red, uh, MESSENGER couldn't see, but we will, and we'll do a better job on all those elements, because we've got a more modern um, X-ray um, um, spectrometer, basically. The principles behind it, I don't want to labour this point, are basically the sun is, the sun is, is quite a bright X-ray source, and these X-rays hit Mercury's surface because there's no atmosphere to get in the way, and that causes fluorescence. The surface fluoresces, and what you detect is fluorescent X-rays whose exact energy is characteristic of whichever element they've come from. So by focusing an image of the fluorescent X-rays from the surface, you get a picture of the elemental abundances across Mercury's surface in the, a dozen or so of the most common elements. What the NASA mission, MESSENGER, was able to do was produce crude X-ray maps like this. The, the bottom right one's a neutron image, but the others are X-rays. Ratios between elements. This is a view looking obliquely down on the North Pole. The southern hemisphere of, Mes of Mercury was hardly seen in X-rays by MESSENGER because it was in an elliptical orbit. So it's got better resolution in the North than the South, and, and there are gaps in the coverage. We'll do this across the whole globe for more elements in better resolution. So here is our spacecraft. It's in four components. At the bottom is the Mercury transfer module. That's the thing with the iron drive, which transports us to Mercury. The thing in the middle is the Mercury planetary orbiter. That's the ESA spacecraft, European Space Agency spacecraft that will do the science. The thing at the top, called MEO, is uh, owned by the Japanese space agency, JAXA. And um, when we get to Mercury, will be in orbits like this. The European orbiter will be in the blue orbit, almost circular, staying close to the planet. The red orbit is what MEO will do. It's more elliptical, has more or less four times the orbital period, goes further from the planet. It will study the magnetic field in great detail. We will also do the magnetic field at the same time from a different position, which is great. And we will be looking down at the planet. And that's what the, the mix instrument will do, as well as various optical cameras. Now, how are we going to get there? I'm going to show you where Bepi is now. I hope. Just open up this website. So, the present view. Here's Bepi Colombo heading back in towards the Earth's orbit. And it's got to get into orbit around Mercury. So, I'm going to grab the slider. If I can. Where's the cursor? There it is. So, grab this, take us back to launch. We launched in October last year. We set off inside the Earth's orbit. Then we went outside the Earth's orbit, and we're coming back in. And next spring, we're going to swing by the Earth, and that will send us inwards, and we'll swing past Venus twice. And having swung past Venus twice, we go in, whoops, and we'll have 
half a dozen encounters with Mercury, each time using Mercury's gravity to slow us down a little bit. So on the seventh time we approach the planet, we're going slowly enough that we can get into orbit. So it's a seven and a half year cruise to get to Mercury. You could get to Mercury really quickly. It's not that far away, but you just sail past it and not stop. When you go to Mercury, the sun's gravity is accelerating you. That iron drive of ours is not to speed us on our way. It's to slow us down. It's firing in the direction of travel to slow us down so we get there slowly. And even so, we have to use Mercury's gravity and Venus's to slow us down so we get there eventually going slowly enough to get into orbit. Seven and a half year cruise. I mean, I, I waited six years between getting my chair and being invited to do this <laughs> inaugural lecture. Um, that's not so bad when you consider asking for a mission in 1994, it being approved in 2000, and then a seven and a half year cruise when you finally launch in, um, in 2018. So that's our trajectory to Mercury. And um, the mission is healthy. Everything is looking quite optimistic now. Um, we don't do any science or much science at Venus and Mercury during all those flybys because the spacecraft's in this stacked configuration. When we finally get there, we jettison the iron drive. And this thing is what gets into orbit about Mercury. Uh, we set Mio, the Japanese thing, spinning to keep it stable and set it into its elliptical orbit. And off it goes and starts studying the magnetic field and the particles. And then we, we throw away the sun shield, whose sole job has been to keep the sun off Mio, and we manoeuvre this into a lower, more circular orbit. And then we start doing our science, looking down at the surface. And that's when the X-ray spectrometer mix will start doing its job. Now, why, do I, why am I so confident that Mercury is going to be an interesting place to study? It's because we've had the messenger mission, a NASA mission, artist's impression of it there. It was launched, um, I forget when, about 2007, but it orbited Mercury from 2011 to 2015, produced a lot of great data. Not as good as we're going to get, but a hell of a lot better than the previous single flyby mission did, Mariner 10. It mapped the entire globe, which had never been done before, it did it in colour. I've exaggerated the colour here because it's a fairly bland world. And um, let me show you um, the whole globe. This should rotate. Yeah. Um, so what can we see? Red areas and blue areas. This circular red area coming into view here. That feature there is the Caloris Basin, the biggest impact basin on Mercury. It's flooded by red lavas. There's red lavas near the poles as well. Let's give it one more spin. It's a globe that's got variety. We think that it, the blue and the red areas are volcanic lavas. It's not like the moon, which has dark patches which are lava and lighter patches, more reflective patches which are not lava, but rocks that have floated up from the mantle in a different way. Mercury is dark everywhere. Its lava flows are slightly different compositions coming out as blue and yellow, broadly speaking. The youngest lavas, including those red ones at the north, are, are around... Whoops are up here, and the Caloris Basin is, is, is down there. How do we know these areas are lavas? Let me show you an image of, of, of part of the, the northern plains, now known as Borealis Planitia. Slightly coloured image here. On the left, or the west, I should say, in the south, it's a more ancient terrain, more craters. Up here, the bulk of the image is less heavily cratered. The older the surface, the longer it's been there to collect impact craters, hitting it and scarring the surface. So it's a younger area. Uh, centre and top right of that image. I'll exaggerate the colour for you. There is a, um, a colour contrast between them as well, which tells you the compositions are slightly different. We're confident it's all lava. It's easiest to see it's lava in the red northern plains. Um, I'm going to show you detail inside that little box there. Here it is in black and white. Can you see the circular feature that's dominating that view? It's... Um, it's all, it's, we think it's all lava, but that's an impact crater that's been flooded by lava. We can still kind of see it through the lava that's flooded it. I mean, there's some craters, line of three craters in the south that are much younger and they're on top of the lava. But what you're seeing there, that circular feature, about 30 kilometres across, is a crater that was there on the previous surface that was flooded by lava. Um, and let me show you a cross-sectional view of, a, of what that crater would look like. A 30-kilometre crater on Mercury has a raised rim 
and a central peak, which is much lower than the raised rim. If you flood it with lava of sufficient depth, you can, comp you can completely hide it. If you let that lava cool down, it's going to contract thermally. It's also going to lose lots of void spaces that were filled with gas, maybe. So it will sag down and do this. And you can see that the rim of the crater is expressing itself topographically there. The central peak's too deep to see, but the rim of the crater's there. And um, that's what we've got here. That's a, a, a flooded crater. We call it a ghost crater. And there are actually several other ghost craters uh, on this image. Uh, I'm perhaps too close to see them, but there's a flooded crater here and up here. Uh, once you've seen one, they're all over the blooming place. Um, so the only way logically for this to happen is, is big floods of volcanic lavas. So ghost craters. Here's the, the inside of the Caloris Basin. It's the southern half of the basin. Now, Caloris Basin has, is filled with red lavas, but there are no ghost craters, which is telling us that the lava flooding there happened so soon after the basin formation, there hadn't been time for younger craters to be formed on the basin floor, or else they're flooded very, very deeply. But I'm going to move on from looking at volcanic flooding to looking at explosive volcanism now. Patches like that one there, that one there, in particular that one there brighter, redder material that's got diffuse edges and usually quite an interesting hole in the middle, such as here, this um, hole in the ground in the middle here, there's a hole in the ground which is not circular, it's been described as kidney shape, I hope my kidney's not that shape, <laughs> and it's got this diffuse deposit around it, uh, here's a ring to show the edges, there's a similar deposit uh, down here, which we'll ignore. But this feature here, we think this is a volcanic explosion crater, and this is the stuff that's been flung out from it. If you're going to have an explosive volcanic eruption, uh, that's telling you that the magma, the molten rock rising towards the surface, has got volatiles dissolved in it, which will come out of solution as the pressure drops and expand violently and throw out fragments. Or else maybe the volatiles have been incorporated from the adjacent rock near the surface. If you've got a volatile rich surface, the volatiles can get into the magma. But either way, you've got to have volatiles in sufficient abundance to give you these explosive eruptions. And here's a kind of cartoon of an explosive eruption on the Earth. The magma rises, bubbles form. If they grow big enough, you throw stuff out with violent force. Um, on the Earth, that would suck in the atmosphere and give you a big billowing convection column. But Mercury has no atmosphere, never has had. One place we can see eruptions into vacuum at the moment is Jupiter's moon Io. Here's a little video from the New Horizons spacecraft going past, and you see that plume coming out. The stuff rises up and falls back to the ground on parabolic proje trajectories. gives you a circular deposit with a diffuse outer edge, just like we see on Mercury. So this is what we've got going on on Mercury in the past, these violent explosive eruptions, which wouldn't happen if it was not a volatile, rich place. Let's look inside that kidney shape vent in more detail. Here's a high-resolution view in, in black and white. That's the <coughs> interior of the kidney-shaped hole in the ground. It is a hole in the ground. It's not a mountain with a crater on top. It's basically a hole in the ground. And what I see is at the western end, it's old enough that there's been time for quite a few small impact craters to form. Over here, there's one tiny impact crater just there, maybe, but it's basically featureless, not old enough that impact craters were formed in numbers. And in the middle, it's very rugged, possibly an even younger surface. And what I think is the first eruption happened there, then there was one here, then the next one was maybe here, then here, then here, then here, and the youngest ones are here and here. It's a whole series. That's nine different explosions in the same region. On the Earth, you'd call this a compound volcano, where the, the locus of activity has migrated to and fro over time. I've seen these on the Earth. On the left, there's a volcano called Lascar, where I worked with Peter Francis and Clive Oppenheimer, overlapping craters. Here's the youngest one. Here's Messiah in Nicaragua, where I've worked with, with Hazel Reimer. Um, and so migrating eruption sites. And if the eruptions are explosive, as they are on Mercury, it's not just telling you that mag magma keeps rising in the, almost the same spot. It's telling you there are volatiles available there, time after time after time, possibly over periods of billions of years. So it's a volatile rich planet that keeps providing the volatiles. Very hard to explain. This is why we want to go to Mercury and suss out what's going on. 
Here's the biggest explosive deposit on Mercury, that big diffuse yellow spot um, in the upper part of that image. It's 250 or so kilometres across. It's called Natair Facula. Here's an oblique view into that vent. It's 30-odd kilometres long and 3 kilometres deep, and you can see some layering in the crust for, up through which it's blasted. And that's been produced by a series of eruptions, we think, as well. It's not a single event to blast that out. And here's a really weird, but not for Mercury, unusual shape. There's an impact crater. Um, I'm going to trace around the rim of the impact crater. The floor was possibly lava flooded, but this banana-shaped hole in the ground with the brightest bit of deposit at the northern end, um, that's been ripped out, we think, by a series of eruptions. It's another compound volcano. There it is in black and white. Highest resolution view. Now, did it all go bang like one that like at once? I think unlikely. It's more likely to have started down there and worked its way up. But we need better detail in the images, which is what Bepi Colombo will give us to suss out the history of this. So that's the volcanologist, the geologist, looking at the surface saying, this is weird. This, is, this ties in with the volatile richness we've got from our X-ray and other measurements. But we don't know what it is that's turned into gas here, but something sure as hell is. When magma arrives at the surface and blasts these holes in the ground, it's telling them it's a volatile rich planet. Completely different evidence for Mercury being volatile rich. This is a much more detailed image, of which there were very few from Messenger. We'll get plenty from Bepi Colombo on the Italian instrument called Symbiosis. We'll have really high resolution over a lot of the globe. That's a 1.5 kilometre wide area, about a mile wide. And what we've got here, um, these are holes in the ground. They're called hollows. Um, you've got uh, steep sides and very flat featureless bottom. And none of the bottoms of these hollows that we can see have any impact craters at all on them. They must be really young features. So they're very young, younger than the explosive volcanic features. We think these are growing uh, even today. How the heck do you form these hollows? OK, that's the word hollows for them. Um, let me show you um, a broader scale view. There's a big peak ring basin there um, that's been flooded by lava, but hollows have developed upon it. And um, in colour, they tend to be, the floors of them tend to be blue. So the red material has been stripped away to expose the blue material as the hollows form. Steep-sided flat bottom. They're only about 20 metres deep, and they can be hundreds of metres to kilometres wide. How do they form? They're not being blown away by the wind. There's no wind. You don't see channels draining away from them. There's, there's no conceivable liquid anywhere which could drain the stuff away. The only way, to, and it's not falling into an underground cavern. The material must be, di must be being lost to space somehow. You, so you're losing an, an, an at least moderately volatile substance. It's been removed without melting, no channels draining away. So the candidate mechanism is a sublimation. That's like when dry ice, frozen CO2, turns from solid to vapour. You can't do that with silicate rock. Um, maybe a space weathering process attacking the rocky particles. Photons, UV photons, ultraviolet photons from the strong sunlight could break chemical bonds and stuff could escape away an atom at a time. Solar wind, charged particles from the sun, which will hit the surface during solar storms, when the magnetic field no longer protects the surface, um, uh, could do it. Uh, micrometeorites could hit the surface and break the bonds, um, but that's estimated to be too slow a process to form hollows, or maybe the planet's being strip-mined by aliens. Uh, I can't rule that out. Uh, Strip-mining by aliens doesn't require <coughs> the surface to be rich in volatiles. All the other processes do. We don't know what the volatiles are, but you're not going to lose them to space if they're not volatile. So it's a volatile rich planet. So here's a cartoon about what's going on in cross section. The red stuff at the top that's, that's volatile rich, the blue stuff below. Strong sun shining at you. Mercury, you're three times closer to the sun than you are at the Earth, so the sun is nine times stronger. So whatever the sun is doing, it's causing surface material to start being lost to space, and it eats down to the bottom of the volatile rich layer then the hollows just get wider and wider. Uh, sublimation, photon-stimulated desorption, micrometeorite sputtering, which isn't the sun, but whatever. Once they reach a certain depth, they don't get any, deep, any deeper, they just get wider. And all the ones we can see are, are young. It's an active process today. I'm sure they turn off eventually. 
Uh, so that's a mystery. We do not know what is being lost in these hollows. We want to measure this material and compare it with the exposed material at the floors of the hollows. We'll have the spatial resolution to do that with various Bepi Colombo instruments. There's some hints from Messenger, um, but they're not really convincing yet. So we're working on that. And I'm looking very much forward to getting there in 2026 when we start doing science um, with this wonderful spacecraft, Bepi Colombo. In the meantime, we are still busy. We're making geological maps. Here's a better view of Jack Wright's map of Mercury, it's this whole quadrangle. Um, two versions of that map, that's got the craters subdivided into three age-related classes, and there are four age-related classes of the craters. And um, you can see maybe up there, this is uh, the Hokusai quadrangle that Jack, Jack's worked on. In collaboration with colleagues across Europe, we're determined to get the whole of this planet mapped before Bepi Colombo gets there. So when we get our observations, we know the geological context of what we're looking at. Now, once the Bepi Colombo mission is finished, our maps will be obsolete. The whole planet will have to be remapped. But these maps, we hope, are going to be very useful during the mission. So these were mapped in Italy. This is Jacks, my current two students who started three and four years ago. Uh, no, three and two years ago, are working here. And um, student Ben, who started just last month, is going to map this quadrangle. And it, we're not far off getting quadrangle maps for the whole planet. That's what we're doing to get ready for Bepi Colombo's mission. Um, it's, it is a pan-European effort. We're receiving funding from the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 programme. We're hoping to start a new student next year to do some mapping. We're hoping to get a consolidated grant to let, let us have a postdoctoral fellow to work on the South Pole and tying all that together. But in the meantime, we're working as a group, French, Italian, German, essentially, to get the whole damn planet mapped. And it's a great project to be involved in. I'm finishing now. I haven't had time to talk about the tectonics on Mercury, but when what a wonderful planet. The globe is contracting. We've got a crater. They have a big compressional fault cutting across it. And we've got weird terrains like this. It's flooded by lava. But, I mean, what the heck is happening here with this, this funny fracture pattern? We don't know. When Bepi Colombo gets there, we will find out. So doing geology on other planets is what my career has turned into after starting doing it on the Earth. And I think it's been a good thing to do. We enjoy teaching it in S283. And I enjoy talking about it. And I enjoy having PhD students working with me on it. So I'll leave you with these very profound thoughts and um, hand back over <laughs> hand back over to Josie thank you for coming thanks very much dave it now gives me great pleasure to introduce professor carol haswell professor of astrophysics carol is head of astronomy at the open university her main research interest is exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than the sun. Carol works on transiting systems and hot planets, which offer a unique opportunity to empirically determine the chemical composition, and that places our solar system in context. Her accolades include the 2010 Royal Astronomical Society Group Achievement Award, as a pioneering member of the Super Wasp team, I really need to ask her what that stands for sometime, and being named one of 20 women selected by the Royal Astronomical Society to appear in a portrait celebrating a century of female fellows. Carol was appointed by the European Space Agency to the science advisory team overseeing the planned aerial mission which will perform spectroscopy of exoplanets and illuminate how planets form and evolve. I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Carol Haswell. Thank you very much, Josie, and thank you very much, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, really appreciate you uh, having interest in, in our subject. So, um, I'm going to tell you about some work that I've been doing over the last 15 years or so, 
Um, the main part of my talk is going to focus on a project that we've led here at the Open University, which is why I've uh, got that rogue capital U in the title. It is our place in the universe, um, the OU. Um, and I'm going to take you on this journey. So it's a, it's a huge honour, actually, to be asked to give one of these inaugural lectures and particularly to be asked to give the final one in, this, in the series. Um, yeah, I feel very honoured by, by being asked to do that. So I started off by reflecting a little <coughs> bit on the 50 years that the OU's been exist in existence and just looking at what we've learned both about planets and more widely about the universe and our place as human beings within it. So that's where I'll start with this lecture. And then the bulk of what I'll talk about is going to be the research that I've been doing and what we've learned um, from the astrophysics research on exoplanets that I've been engaged in for about the last 15 years. And then towards the end, I'll talk about another project, which has been a Europe-wide collaboration, which has had some very, very exciting results, finding the very closest planets orbiting the sun's nearest neighbour stars. And then I'll end by reflecting a little bit on the next 50 years and what that might bring, um, both in terms of astrophysics and more broadly. So I started um, just looking at the astrophysics of 50 years ago, um, when the Open University was formed. So I had a look, and it's very, very easy to do this now with, with all of the online databases and interfaces, to actually find which astrophysics paper in 1969 was the most influential. And it was um, this paper on pulsar electrodynamics. So this is about the magnetic fields of a collapsed star, which has collapsed to the density of an atomic nucleus. And I was particularly chuffed to find that out because that paper has an open university connection. Um, so the um, picture on the right is a portrait of Dame Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who was actually the head of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the time that I was recruited to the Open University. And she was actually, um, began her uh, career as a PhD student in Cambridge, and she actually discovered pulsars by looking at radio signals. And she was the person who discovered pulsars. So it's really nice that in the founding year of the Open University, we had that um, connection um, in what was to play out over the 50 years of the OU's life. Um, and I also thought it would be nice to sort of just have a quick look at what we knew about planets in 1969. And this was one of the most influential papers in 1969 on the planets of our own solar system. And it turns out we didn't actually really know all that much about planets in 1969, which I found a bit surprising. So the, the graph on the right here shows a number of lines on the horizontal axis is depth going down into the Earth, into the interior of the Earth, and on the vertical axis is the temperature. And if you look at those lines, those are various people's idea about how the temperature varies as you drill down into the Earth. And you can see there's a factor of three disagreement in what the temperature of the centre of the Earth was as state-of-the-art knowledge in 1969. So we really didn't know all that much about planets 50 years ago. And it's really quite astonishing how far we've come. So the, the uh, lecture we've just enjoyed from Dave showed us that we actually now really know rather a lot of detailed information about the other planets in our own solar system. And I hope I'll convince you that we actually know quite a lot about planets that are orbiting other stars outside our own solar system. So these are exciting times that we're living in, that we're on this epic journey of human discovery, finding out about the universe. And this is one of my earliest memories, actually. Um, this is a picture that was taken on the surface of the moon by the first people who walked on the surface of the moon. So the picture was actually taken by Neil Armstrong, who you can see reflected in Buzz Aldrin's uh, helmet faceplate. And... Uh, this is really exciting, and it has a current Open University connection as well, because we enjoyed, about a month ago, a visit from space royalty. Andy Aldrin, who's the son of Buzz Aldrin, visited us here at the Open University, and he is sort of, in a sense, following in his father's footsteps. He's very interested in space. 
He's very interested in education and very interested in space entrepreneurship. And all of the, those things um, link up with things that we're interested in doing here. So we're living in very exciting times still. Um, now, getting to exoplanets, back in 1969, we really didn't know whether the planets in our solar system were completely unique in our galaxy. We didn't know if generally stars are accompanied by planets. And this was a viable theory for how the planets of the solar system were formed back in 1969. Planet formation might have required a very rare and unusual event like two planets, sorry, two stars almost colliding and pulling material from the outer layers of the star, which then coalesces to form the planets. And if this was indeed the way planets were formed, then our own solar system could have been completely unique. The sun might have been the only star of the billions and billions of stars in the galaxy which actually had planets. And this, this was actually a viable picture until quite recently, until about the 1990s. We, doubt, we now know that actually planets form with stars with no special requirements. And in fact, the laws of physics insist that angular momentum has to be conserved. So as the star collapses, you get this disk of material forming and the planets naturally form under their own self-gravity out of that disk. So we now know that planets form with stars with no special requirements. So we expect that when we look up into the night sky and we see stars, each of those stars will actually have planets orbiting around it or there's a very good chance that it will do. Um, I should also say, this is not an astronomical image. This is an artist's impression of what a planetary system forming around another star may look like. And we very rarely, literally, get pictures like this in astronomy. We, we have to use indirect inferences to work out what's going on. And then we talk to artists who make these beautiful pictures. And there is a danger that when we just sort of send these to journalists, they're presented as though this is actually what the telescope saw. It's not. <laughs> so it's, it's quite important to bear that in mind. And uh, if you zip backwards and forwards there, you can see, as well as learning a lot about science, our scientific visualizations have improved enormously <laughs> as well in the last 50 years. And uh, I think um, there's an awful lot of graphic artists doing really beautiful things that people 50 years ago would be very, very impressed by. Um, so we know um, that there are lots of planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. And we know that because we've found about 4,000 of them. And statistically, by scaling up where we've got information, having looked for stars in detail, we know that there are many, many planets uh, orbiting other stars in our galaxy. And in fact, the galaxy contains more planets than stars. So that's a lot of planets. Um, the giant planets, planets like Jupiter, are the easiest to find for obvious reasons. They're bigger, they're brighter, they have more of an influence on their surroundings. But we do know that there are many, many Earth-sized planets in our galaxy. So small, presumably rocky planets like the Earth are actually more common than giant planets. So this is really quite exciting. And this is where the Star Trek aspect of my title comes from. As we find out more and more about the contents of our galaxy, more and more, it seems to resemble the galaxy that Captain Kirk um, went uh, exploring on this um, TV series back in the 1960s, which was another one of my earliest memories. And myself and many people my age used to negotiate very hard with their parents to be allowed to stay up to the end of Star Trek, which was, yeah, was it sort of bordered bedtime. Um, so this is, this is a picture of what the galaxy and human exploration of the galaxy might have looked like about 50 years ago. And one of the things that I like about the lower picture is that even the alien kind of looks like a middle-aged white guy, which <laughs> yeah, sort of was the worldview back in the 1960s. And more recently, there's a little bit more diversity and a little bit more imagination. So this is a still 
from a recent film, Star Wars, The Force Awakens. And you can see here the two major characters included are different demographically. Women are allowed to take part in the adventures now, and people of colour are allowed to take part in the adventures now. And I think that's a good thing. I think, I think in the last 50 years, I wouldn't say that's directly the influence of the OU, but I think the OU has helped. We're open to people um, of all kinds, and that's, that's good. So, I'm now going to move into sort of talking in a little bit more detail about stars and planets. And as Dave foreshadowed, I'm going to talk about transiting planets, planets that happen to be lined up so they pass between us and their host star from our point of view here on Earth. And those are special because we can learn more about those planets than we can about planets that are not lined up in that way. Um, so the first thing that I should say, and probably everybody here knows this, but I'll say it anyway just so we're all on the same page, is that stars are much bigger and much brighter than planets. And as an astronomer, if you're working on planets, that's a little bit of a nuisance <laughs> because astronomers work with light. And so it's very, very difficult to detect planets because they always come with a star which outshines them. So it's really hard to detect planets. And Dave mentioned it's quite hard to see Mercury. Well, it's much, much harder to find an exoplanet because it's much, much further away. And from the distance we're viewing it, it completely overlaps its host star <coughs> in most cases. So stars are, are easy to study. Planets are difficult to study. And the graph sort of says the same thing as the words, but it says, says it in, in a more quantitative way. So in the optical light that our eyes are sensitive to, the sun is about 10 billion times brighter than the Earth. So that's what we're up against as astronomers. And in fact, what we do is a very clever trick. Rather than looking for the light from the planet, what we do is we indirectly detect and characterize the planet by looking at the effect that the planet has on the light from the star. And the easiest way to do this is to use the transit method. So if you simply collect the light from a star and measure its brightness, what you will find is if it, that star happens to have planets that are oriented correctly, so the planets pass in front of the star, every time the planet comes round, you'll see the star get slightly fainter as the planet gets in the way and blocks some of the starlight. And you see this happen regularly, and that immediately tells you how long the planet takes to complete one circuit around the star. So it tells you what the planet's orbital period, or equivalently, what the length of the year is on that planet, how long it takes to go once around. So this is really very simple. And um, as a scientist, it's always really nice to work on things that are very simple, because it gives you a bit more confidence that you're getting things right because you can actually understand what you're doing in detail. So the planet detection by transits is a really lovely method, and it also gives us a lot of information about the planet. It's actually the only way we can directly measure the size of a planet outside our own solar system. And you can do that simply by <coughs> measuring how much light you've lost when the planet gets in the way of the star. So it tells you the size of that black circle relative to the size of the white circle. And we all know that the area of a circle is pi r squared, so that tells you immediately how big your planet is. So that's great. And you can also learn other more detailed things, like exactly how lined up is the orbit. You can actually tell by the shape of the dip whether the planet is sort of going across the bottom of the stellar disk or whether it's going across the middle of the stellar disk. And that would give you a different detailed shape of that dip. So transiting planets are great. They allow us to know, learn an awful lot about the star, about the, the, about the planet. Um, there's also another thing that we can do, and this is a, a slide that I've pinched um, from one of our Open University Astronomy modules. And if you want to learn more about stars and planets, this is the very subtle sales message. Take an OU degree because we teach all of this and it's all great stuff. Um, one of the things that we can do with light, 
as physicists is we can use it to learn about composition. And Dave has already told us how you can do that with, with X-rays uh, through X-ray fluorescence. But the way that astronomers quite often use is if light is being filtered through a gas, then the atoms in the gas will select out particular narrow colours of light and absorb them. And so that's what's going on across the top of this slide. The light is shining through a gas and the atoms in the gas are selecting out their own spectral lines. Each chemical element has its own sort of fingerprint of spectral lines. So as astronomers, by looking at light which has been filtered through a gas, we can tell what the chemical composition of that gas is. So without going there, without taking a sample, we can learn about the chemistry. And this was actually how the chemical element helium was discovered. It was discovered in the atmosphere of the sun by astronomers before anybody realised that helium was here and present on the Earth. So this is a really nice technique um, that astronomers use a lot to know what things are made of. And you can apply this to transiting exoplanets. So this is a zoom in. Again, the black sort of segments of circles is the silhouette of a planet that's crossing its star. And if that planet has an atmosphere that's translucent, then actually at those exact colours of the light being absorbed by the chemicals in the atmosphere, the planet will appear a bit bigger. So by measuring a transiting exoplanet and spreading the light out into its component colours and measuring how deep it dips at each colour, you can actually work out the composition of the atmosphere of the planet, even though you can't directly see the planet. And this is stuff I think is just really, really exciting. And I sort of learned quite a lot about my own psychology uh, when exoplanets were discovered. Because until exoplanets were discovered, which have so much scope for the imagination, I thought planets were quite boring. <laughs> but uh, now I think planets are absolutely fascinating. Um, so this is one of the things that we can do, and I'll come back to related things uh, later in the lecture. But there was a particular example of this in 2003. Somebody pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at the exact wavelength of the strongest spectral line of hydrogen which is the most common chemical element in the, in the universe. And what they found was rather than about a 1% dip in the light from the star, which is caused by the opaque planet itself getting in the way, there was actually a 15% dip at this precise colour where hydrogen absorbs. And that tells you that this planet is actually surrounded by a whacking great cloud of hydrogen. And I saw this um, publication in nature and I just thought this is just too exciting to ignore. So that was the point that I turned my back on my previous research field and decided exoplanets were for me um, and I've never looked back. Um, so what I did was I led the Open University into the Super Wasp collaboration and since Josie wants to know what that is, um, the super is just because it's really good and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, WASP stands for Wide Area Search for Planets. And this was a, a large UK co collaboration involving all of these institutions and dozens of people. And it brought people together into an exciting new field. And it was sort of a, a plucky UK low budget project and it's been immensely successful. Um, this is another view of uh, one of our facilities. And those lenses, that what look like the little telescopes there, those are actually Canon camera lenses that were designed for theatre photography. And they'd all been discontinued by Canon with the onset of digital photography when they needed new lenses to work with CCDs rather than photographic films. And they'd been remaindered and sent to Korea. So as uh, one of the few women who was involved in WASP in the early days, I got the shopping mission, and so I, um, I purchased most of those camera lenses um, on eBay um, using our grant funding, which was a little bit nerve-wracking because this was in the early days of e-commerce. Um, so I bought all of those lenses from a very nice man in South Korea who I never met, but he kept up his side of the bargain and we sent him the money. And uh, 
WASP has been an incredibly <coughs> successful um, collaboration. It's still going. It's discovered about 200 transiting exoplanets now. And this is a family portrait album from the early days. So you can see here our first 15 um, planet discoveries, which are imaginatively named WASP-1 to WASP-15. And uh, what you can see in these thumbnails is a cartoon which represents the size and the color of the host star in, the, in, in color and the size of the planet. So the size of the planet you can see by the size of the, re of the black dot, which indicates the planet is a transiting planet. And then I hope you can also see the sort of the, the line which indicates the planet's orbit. So of all of these planets, one of the most extreme is WASP-12, which is third from the top on the right-hand side. And that is in a very, very, very short period orbit. So it orbits round a very bright star with an orbital period of just over one day. So it's extremely close. It's extremely irradiated. And it's sort of being baked alive. And... Uh, you can see that that black dot is actually bigger than the other black dots. So this is one of the largest exoplanets that we've found. Um, so I'm now going to move into the main project that I'm going to tell you about, which was inspired by work that I did on WASP-12b. And this project is called the Dispersed Matter Planet Project. And it's a project that I conceived and led, and we've just got our first results, and we're really, really very excited and chuffed about the whole thing. Um, so this, again, is that thumbnail of, of WASP-12, so you can see there in the blue line just how tight that orbit is. The um, planet is only about one stellar diameter away from the surface of the star. It really is being baked alive. And the graph on the right-hand side on the x-axis is irradiating flux. So that's just how much light from the star is baking the planet. And on the, on the vertical axis is the size of the planet. And in the open circles are plotted all of the exoplanets that we knew back in 2009 when we found WASP-12 using SuperWASP. And you can see they all cluster together, except there's one point in the top right-hand corner and that's WASP-12. So you can see that's, that's a bit extreme. So I thought, gosh, that one's really interesting. Um, it's really being baked alive, and it's much bigger than the other planets. And those two facts are related. The amount of heat it's collecting is causing it to expand. And so it's a very large planet. Um, and... Since I'd done my shopping mission, I was given the privilege of being able to lead the Hubble Space Telescope follow-up observations of this particular star-planet system. So we pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at WASP-12 in the ultraviolet, and the graph on the left-hand side shows a zoom-in on what we saw when we spread out the ultraviolet light from WASP-12 into very fine wavelengths, and then vertically is just telling us how much light we're getting at each of those very narrowly defined colors. So WASP-12 is plotted in black, and you'll see that the overall shape of what you can see in that graph there is like a W. For WASP-12, the W, the two bottom bits of the W, intersect zero. So there are two narrow colors there that if we looked at that star we would see absolutely zero light, even though there's a star there. Um, and every other star in the galaxy, as far as we knew at that point, had the sort of um, behavior that you can see in the red, green, and blue lines, where instead of going down to zero, at the bottom of the, the W, you get a little peak. And that's an inevitable um, consequence of the structure of a star like the sun, which is burning hydrogen to helium at its core. You always get that little emission peak at the bottom of that W. And that was missing in WASP-12, making the star that hosts this very odd planet completely unique, as far as we knew in 2012. So we developed a hypothesis to explain that. And it seemed unlikely to me 
that the, the star would be unusual in its structure and also independently have this very unusual um, planet orbiting around it. It seemed much more likely to me that those two very unusual properties were causally related. One of them is causing the other. And so I developed this picture that, in fact, what's going on is that the planet, which is being baked alive and we know is very large, is actually losing mass. And that mass is forming a shroud of gas which completely surrounds the star. So that when we're looking at the star, we're actually looking through a gas shroud which consists of material that has been dispersed from the very hot mass-losing planet. And that absorbing gas imprints clues on the starlight. And the first clue that we saw was that that graph goes down to zero at the bottom of the W. So the absorbing gas imprints clues on the starlight. And that absorbing gas clue indicates that the star hosts a mass-losing planet. The mass-losing planet is feeding the gas shroud and we're looking through it and that imprints a clue on the starlight. So this, I thought, could potentially give us a very quick and easy way of identifying those stars which are hosting these very extremely hot mass-losing planets. So I thought what we should do is look at all of the bright nearby stars to see which one have similar clues to WASP-12. So that's what we did. Now, as I said earlier, giant planets are quite easy to find. And bright nearby stars are what astronomers like to study, everything else being equal. So I expected that all of the giant Jupiter-like planets around bright nearby stars would already have been discovered. So I thought this clue would give us a shortcut to finding low-mass, small, rocky planets orbiting bright nearby stars. And having watched Star Trek as a child, I'm much more interested in those low-mass, rocky planets that we could potentially walk around on. So this was my hypothesis, that actually we could use this clue to find some really interesting objects. And then the other thing, just like when planets form, angular momentum suggests that the gas that's being lost should stay in a disk that's concentrated around the orbit of the planet that's losing the mass, which means that we should actually, if we see that clue, be looking at the system edge on so that we're likely actually to be finding planets that are transiting. As I hope I convinced you earlier, the transiting ones are special. Those are the ones that we really want to find. So, that was the hypothesis. So now I'm going to tell you what happened when we uh, tried to apply that. So, what we did was we, first of all, found a way of comparing the spectra of all of the bright nearby stars in a way that sort of tells us which one has the clue that there's absorbing gas. <coughs> so you don't really need to worry too much about the details, but what's plotted on the y-axis here is how much light there is that's sort of peaking up where that W went down to zero in WASP-12. The yellow squares on this graph are all stars that we already know that host transiting Jupiter-sized planets. And the very bottom yellow dot over towards the left-hand side of that graph corresponds to WASP-12, which, as you saw earlier, is very extreme and does everything more than any other similar planet. And the, the x-axis, I should probably say, just spreads the stars out so you can see where they all are and they're not all plotted on top of each other. But the x-axis is just how massive the star is or equivalently what colour it is. The red line corresponds to what you would expect to a star like the Sun, which is very, very magnetically quiet. And there should be no main sequence stars like the Sun bur burning hydrogen to helium at their core, which lie below the red line intrinsically. So WASP-12 and the other yellow dots, we know 
post-mass losing planets. And we looked at about 3,000 stars, and those are all the blue dots, and we plotted them on this graph, and lo and behold, 39 of them lie below that red line. So those are showing the clue that there is a mass losing planet present orbiting around that star that we haven't detected yet. And for the reasons that I told you, my hypothesis was that these are actually low mass, probably rocky, probably transiting planets. So these are potentially very, very interesting objects to find. So we found 39 targets, and then we went to look for planets orbiting around them. And this is the method that we used. So just like the transiting method, we're using the starlight to find the planet. And you may think that planets orbit around stars, but actually from the point of view of physics, the planet and the star are both masses and they both obey the laws of physics. So the planet and the star actually are both in orbit around the common center of mass of the system. So as you can see there on the cartoon, the star is doing a little orbit because it has almost all the mass, while the planet does a big orbit. And the uh, rainbow colored band at the bottom shows you how those spectral lines, which arise because there are chemicals in the stellar atmosphere, move backwards and forwards due to the Doppler shift as the star responds to the gravitational pull of the planet and goes around its orbit. So this is the so-called radial velocity method of discovering planets. So we're looking for very small motions of the star indicated by that Doppler shift, which we can see in the starlight. So we tried to apply this method to our 39 bright nearby stars to search for our low mass rocky planets that are very close into the stars and being heated to the point that they're losing their volatiles to form a circumstellar um, gas shroud. And this is where we did the work. This is the European Southern Observatory in Chile. It's a mountaintop called La Silla in the Andes. And um, on the left-hand side, there's a photograph I took at sunset, which um, sort of gives you a snapshot of just how breathtakingly beautiful it is to be there. And then the main picture is the control room, which has actually been the place where most of the radial velocity planets that we know of has been discovered. And you can see from the control room, you get a lovely view of sunset, which is invariably beautiful in the Andes. But um, being a scientist isn't all fun and glamour. So actually, we spend most of our time with the blinds shut, staring at those two computer screens, working very hard. But we try to always enjoy the sunset before the, the night's work starts. And um, so just to remind you what, we're, what we were doing was looking at those 39 blue dots that lie below the red line, searching for low mass, short period rocky planets in orbit around those stars. And um, I hope this is probably not that much of a surprise since I'm showing off about it, <laughs> but we did actually find them, which has been the most thrilling thing of my career actually. So this is our poster child um, discovery. Um, so what is plotted along the x-axis here is time in days, and all of the colored points in the upper graph are our measurements. And so you can see we've been back to the telescope several times. Our measurements span about two and a half years. And what we've discovered is four or five low mass rocky planets orbiting this particular star which we have renamed DMPP1. So we're st staking our claim on it because we've, um, we've done some original work to say this is a special system because it shows these clues. And we found a system of four or five rocky planets which are causing the star to do quite a complicated orbit because there's several planets orbiting around it just as there are several planets orbiting around the sun. So its motion is a superposition of its reaction to all of those different planets pull. So you get this complicated jiggly shape due to the four or five planets that we've discovered. And uh, these are the people that did the work. So uh, here we are looking sort of quite geeky and smug because we've, 
we found things. Um, so that's me in the middle. Uh, John Barnes is a postdoc who's done a lot of the technical work. And on the right-hand side is Daniel Staub, who was a PhD student working with us. And uh, he's now gone uh, to work in industry, and he's making plasma rockets to go exploring space uh, more directly. Um, so these, we were the people that were responsible for most of this work. And uh, one thing that we like to show off about is that this was a very efficient way of finding planets. Because we knew exactly what we were looking for from the clue and the logic we applied, um, we actually were about two and a half times more efficient than the nearest comparable discovery. Um, so this is, is quite nice. It's always good to use telescope time efficiently because astronomers always have more things they want to learn about than there is telescope time available. So this is, a, again, an artist's impression. This is not what we saw, but we have a, a system of four or five planets, at least one of which is losing mass and forming a circumstellar gas shroud. And if that, dis if that dispersed gas is in the orbital plane, then transits are likely, and we'll be able to measure the size of those planets. Handily, NASA has launched a really great space telescope called TESS for measuring transits, and we do actually have a marginal detection of a transit in the system at um, a depth of less than 100 parts per million. So this is really high-precision work, and we're not completely ready to, to claim this, but we, we think we might have found a transiting planet in this system, meaning that it's exactly lined up so the planets cross in front of the star from our point of view. This is our second discovery, and this one was a little bit of a surprise. As I said, I thought that all of the giant planets would already be known orbiting these bright nearby stars. Uh, and this is actually a giant planet about the mass of Saturn. And as you can see here, this isn't such a pretty graph as the first one that I showed you. Um, there's actually an enormous amount of scatter around this um, motion of the star in response to the gravitational pull of the planet. And that's because this star is not well behaved for doing this very precise Doppler shift work. And in fact, what's going on is that the star is pulsating. So the star itself is wobbling, um, which makes it more difficult to discover the planet. But because we had the clue in the starlight, we persisted and found this Saturn mass planet where other people had looked and then just given up. So... The nice thing about this one is because the star is pulsating, we can get a lot of really precise knowledge about the structure and the composition of the star. So we can actually learn more about the planet because we have very precise knowledge about the star. So this, again, is a very, very interesting system for further work. And again, if the dispersed gas that we use to find it is in the orbital plane, then transits are likely. So this, again, is likely to be a very, very interesting system for follow-up. And then finally, this is actually the most interesting of the, uh, the systems we've discovered so far. So as you can see on the video, um, what we've got is two things, one orbiting around the other in a very eccentric orbit, and we were, we were looking for very small motions due to low-mass planets. And what we found was a whacking great motion due to a low-mass star. So we found a previously unknown star in this eccentric orbit around our target, which was a star that's about 90% of the mass of the sun, and as far as we knew, unremarkable, apart from showing this particular absorption signature in the starlight. And what we found was an object that's right at the very threshold for sustaining nuclear fusion to power a star. So the smaller of those two objects is what's called a red dwarf star, right at the very bottom of the main sequence of stars, only just able to sustain the temperatures and pressures to do nuclear fusion and shine like the sun does. Um, so that's an interesting object in its own right and worth further study. Um, however, we did find what we were looking for, too. Um, orbiting the sun-like star, there is a 2.6-mass planet in about a seven-day orbit, and it's a challenge to see how this particular planetary system formed. 
because um, if you've got a binary star where the star's coming very close in to each other, that will truncate and disrupt the um, disk that the planets are going to form from. So this is a very unusual system and no other um, binary star system anywhere near this tight is known to host planets. So this is probably, of all of the things we've found so far, the most interesting from the point of view of the astrophysics we can learn from it. Um, so I'm now going to tell you a little bit about the mass radius composition relationships for rocky planets, picking up on another aspect of what Dave talked about. Um, so as we've already seen, Absorbing gas can reveal the composition of the material in the gas through those sort of chemical fingerprints that get imprinted on the starlight. Um, so that's, again, our OU Level 2 astronomy module picture of how that works. Atoms pick out particular wavelengths of light and leave their chemical fingerprint. Um, so here is a graph on the x-axis. It shows you the mass of planets and on the y-axis, it shows you the radius of the planets. And the lines which are drawn on the graph indicate what you would expect for the mass-radius relationship for particular compositions. So Dave already showed us Mercury, which has an unusually large fraction of its composition being composed of iron. And the red line at the bottom shows you the mass radius relationship that you would expect if you built a planet completely from iron, which is the densest material we know of. And so you don't expect to ever find a planet more dense than that red line. And plotted on the graph are the masses and radii of various planets, all of which are less, uh, all of which are less dense than iron. So that's good. And the, 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 um, in, the, in the bottom corner, you can see Venus and the Earth. And their masses and radii are known really rather accurately, because obviously we can measure them quite easily. And you can see for the Earth and Venus, we can get a good idea of what the composition is from that mass and radius relationship. Whereas for the exoplanets, because we're working with the very dim light from a star, we have much less idea um, and much less precision on our mass and radius measurements. So those, those measurements have big uncertainties attached to them and are consistent with a number of different composition models. Now, the planets that we're finding, we're measuring the mass using the Doppler shift of the starlight. For those that transit, we can measure the radius using the transit depth. And by looking at the chemical uh, fingerprints of the dispersed material, we can actually measure the composition as well. So these objects that we're finding in this OU-led project are actually going to revolutionize our knowledge of the galaxy's rocky planet uh, uh, population and allow us to know the mass-radius composition relationship for these planets directly. Um, just very quickly, um, Dave told us that rock can't sublime. Um, in astrophysics, we have much more scope for the imagination, and uh, I'm here to tell you that rock can sublime. Uh, so this is a discovery from the Kepler mission, and this is a, an object that's about the size and mass of Earth's moon in a 16-hour orbit around its host star. So it's really, really very, very close to its star, and it's really, really being heated to a very high temperature. And if you heat rock to about 2,000 degrees, it does sublime. And this particular planet is too small to detect, as Dave said. However, its rocky surface is being turned into gas and leaving the planet. And as the uh, material leaves the planet, dust condenses out of that metal-rich vapor. So you actually see a transit of a dust cloud that's entrained in the orbit of the planet. And this gives us some... Um, some uh, possibilities to actually start examining the mineralogy of this ablating surface. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. However, our discoveries might include some bright nearby examples of that. So we might be able to do some really interesting exoplanet geology, taking what Dave's doing and moving it um, beyond our own solar system. So these um, allow detailed study. And the more we find out about our galaxy, 
the more it resembles the galaxy in Star Trek. Um, and I just find that really, really very exciting. Um, and uh, it, it, it gets me out of bed and into the office to sit in front of the computer every morning. Um, so finally, I'm going to just quickly tell you a little bit about planets in the neighborhood. So this is a European project that um, I'm involved in, involving uh, collaborators mainly in uh, Spain and Germany. In 2016, John Barnes, who worked with me, was um, one of the discoveries of Proxima b, which is the very, very closest exoplanet to the, um, to the solar system. It orbits a very low-mass star, Proxima Centauri, which you can see on the right-hand side of uh, the graphic, about four light years away. And then in um, 2018, we found a planet orbiting Barnard's star, which is the closest single star to the sun. So it seems as, as, as soon as we start looking in detail at the sun's neighbor stars, we're finding planets orbiting all of them. Um, so at the bottom there is the sun, and there's an indication of the Oort cloud. And in fact, the Oort cloud goes actually halfway to the nearest exoplanet. Um, and there's a reason for that. The Oort cloud is, is uh, low-mass bodies that are entrained by the sun's gravity. And as all the stars orbit around the center of the galaxy, they each have this sort of large cloud of bodies that follow them around. And sometimes, I guess, they probably swap. But the Oort cloud goes halfway to the nearest exoplanet, which I think actually offers some um, possibilities for exploration. So rather than going on a generation ship, um, to the nearby exoplanets, we could possibly hop from rock to rock and get there more slowly and gradually. That would be a long-term project, I think. You, know, you would need tens of thousands of years to do that, but perhaps we could do that. And we, we do live in exciting times where we can actually think about things like this. Um, so I'm going to end by just quickly talking about what we might expect in the next 50 years. Um, I think... What will happen in the next 50 years depends crucially on our collective decision making. And I think you could say that over the last few years, there have been some poor collective decisions made. Um, and I think the Open University's mission is more important than ever. I think it's really important, particularly in democracies, that as many people in, as possible are educated and are able to think for themselves and evaluate evidence and make good, rational decisions. And it's really, really important that we get our act together and make good decisions to you know, secure the future for the next generations. So I think the Open University's mission is very, very important, um, both our education mission and our wider sort of public understanding of science mission. And then finally, I'm going to end... Um, on a personal note, so um, I'm in this picture, which was taken about 50 years ago. It was taken in a, an ordinary junior school on Teesside, and um, there's a picture of all the girls in the class, and we had a fabulous teacher called Mrs. Mason, who was extremely influential. She was the first person who said to me, you should go to university. I'd never really heard of university. I, you know, like, what's that then? Um, and of that picture, which is just an ordinary junior school class, four of those girls became university academics, which is really remarkable, I think. And I think what will happen in the next 50 years depends on each of us as individuals, how we use our time and energy, how we influence others. And I think if only a handful of us are as influential and positive as Mrs. Mason, we've all got a good collective future. Thank you. So my thanks to David and Carol for two uh, fantastic lectures. And it's now time for our Q&A. So I'm going to ask Dave to come back up and join myself and Carol. Um, I'm going to ask a really dumb question. <coughs> So then everyone else who has a question afterwards doesn't need to feel bad. Um, <laughs> are the two areas that you're looking at related? Because you're talking about 
so something that may be like sublimation of mercury, and then you're talking about a huge amount of uh, mass being exited from a rocky planet close to its sun. Could it be the same process? It's just in a smaller scale. Possibly. Mercury is losing an infinitesimal amount of mass, whereas Carol's looking at rather more extreme objects. Yeah, though, though my objects are also not, not losing a lot of mass, but the gas shroud gives us a very sensitive way of detecting it. So I think they, they are, they are um, related. I think my objects are just more extreme and exciting yeah. than Dave's. <laughs> <laughs> I think I maybe should have sat in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to chime in with a question? There's one here on the live stream. So this is a question from Jack Parsons, who's a NEFOR AS student here, here at the Open University. My question is regarding exoplanets. How far away are we from being able to send a probe to other solar systems, and what experiments would be undertaken? What do you want to find? Ooh, great question. So um, we're really not far away at all. So there is a project called Breakthrough Starshot, which is aiming to use lasers to fire lots of little nano cameras and power them with light sails and send them to the Proxima B system to beam back pictures. So that's something that's actually being conceived and people are doing engineering work on it now. Um, and I think you know, sending back a picture would probably be the first step. I think, I think it would be really lovely to go there, but that, I think that's, you know, we need to go to Mars first, I think. Mm. It's a 50-year travel time with these light sails. Something of that order, isn't it? Well, it depends how fast they go. I don't know exactly. But yeah. it, it's decades. Yeah. <laughs> it makes your seven years look a bit better, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> question here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mandy and I'm from Milton Keynes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to ask Dave, um, if uh, the da David of today uh, could go back with all the knowledge that you know now about mer Mercury and, uh, you know, volcanic behaviour and all the things that you know now, uh, what would you say to the uh, to yourself in the 1970s about <laughs> Earth geology, knowing what you know now? Good question. <laughs> I don't know what it's taught me about Earth's geology. It's Earth's geology that's taught me about other planets, except you look at Mars, not Mercury, or Venus, and see the extremes of climate change that have gone on there. It's made me realise that extreme climate changes can happen on a planet like ours as well. Probably not as extreme through natural processes, but if we're not careful, we're sending Earth in the direction of Venus, which we don't want. So I think comparative planetology, putting planets into context, is important. I love these pictures from rovers on Mars, which roll along and see a little cross-section through a layer of sedimentary rock, and you can see that the grains are pebbles that must have been transported by water. And you can see the structures in them that show you flowing water or dried out lake beds. And we can recognize the same processes on other planets that we can on the Earth. And it all begins to fit together into a picture of the variety of processes playing out in slightly different ways on different worlds. And I think if I could go back to my 1970 self, I'd say what you're doing is going to turn out to be quite interesting. <laughs> Not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be super. Yeah, good. <laughs> You've got to work on the superlatives for the grant <laughs> proposals. It's a very academic thing to say. Yeah. Your life's you work this, is quite Carol? interesting. I can. Okay, good. I just Definitely wondered. I should have got Star Trek into my yes. title. <laughs> yeah, um, there's one here, and I think there was another one somewhere. Thank you. Hey, it's Richard Foster Fletcher. Carol, what do you hope that we might see or find on these exoplanets? We haven't talked about mining. We haven't talked about other life forms. Um, we haven't talked about anything like that, really. So what, what could we find? What could we see? Well, I think, I think initially we just need to try and understand planets in all their variety. 
just um, to put our own solar system and our own Earth in context. And I think you know, there has been talk about biomarkers and finding evidence for life on other planets, but I think before we really start doing that, we need to just understand better planets themselves. And I think you know, there's at least a couple of decades of, of careful work to, to do on that. And there's a couple of really big missions um, that the European Space Agency is planning, Plato and Ariel, which will do some really important work in letting us understand the diversity of planets in the galaxy. So those are going to launch in about 2026 and 2028. Um, so I think that's going to be the big thing that people are working for towards for the next 10 years or so. Can I say something about mining? Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody would think about mining exoplanets. But the, the economics of going and bringing stuff back to Earth doesn't make sense, but going there and exploiting the resources so you can set up a self-sustaining base or a new civilization, that might be what you do, but you've got to pick your exoplanet very, very carefully, because not many of them will be habitable by humans. Could we build a megastructure from Mercury? Could we build a megastructure from Mercury? Uh, uh, you, you could. You wouldn't want to build a megastructure that close to the sun, because it's too hot there. You want to be further out. Where it's, and so you've got to haul your stuff out from the sun's gravitational well to a comfortable distance from the sun temperature-wise. A Dyson sphere is something that encapsulate, encapsulates an entire star. If you built it at Mercury's distance from the, from the sun, it would be too hot. You'd have to build it at about the Earth's distance from the sun. So why go to Mercury and then haul all that stuff all the way out? It costs an enormous energy cost. I mean, now we know that almost every, most star, more stars have planets than don't. We don't know any that are inhabited by technological civilizations. It would be a surprise if none of them are. But we haven't seen any giant works of, of engineering in space. Nobody's built a Dyson sphere that we can see. We should have an infrared signature, shouldn't it, Carol? I'm not sure anybody's done a very careful uh, search to eliminate that possibility. Bloody well should have done. What have you astronomers been playing at? <laughs> well, we've got more planets than you have. <laughs> I almost don't dare go to the next one. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Jonathan Clough from Cambridge, and actually on the subject of finding planets, um, a lot of the transiting exoplanets, well, not a lot, but some have been found through citizen science because yes. there's been, been so much data. Yeah. Um, and I just wondered whether a similar approach could be taken with your, uh, uh, your dissolving planet scenario. Could light curves or, or light signatures from lots of stars be put onto online? And could you then get a lot more discoveries feeding into your, your project? I think, I think the project that I'm working on that I described is probably not particularly amenable to citizen science because it's a fairly small number of targets and it was quite a lot of work actually to identify the targets. And the measurements we need to make are very, very precise. So actually you, you need quite a lot of training to be able to do that very precise work. There are other things that, that lend themselves to citizen science and um, there are other things that, that we're doing here at the Open University that lend themselves to citizen science. So th there's definitely stuff that can be done. Um, and if, you know, if you're particularly interested in, in doing things, then come and talk to us about the skills that you have and that you can bring to the table because uh, you know, astrophysics, there's always more things to do than we've got time to do. So. Thank you. There's one at the front here. And I think there was... Sorry, we... No? Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello, my name's Owen. Um, this question is for David. Um, you were talking about how um, uh, Mercury's core is significantly larger in relation to it. Um, so do you know um, to what extent there's like more extreme magnetic fields um, in relation to the size of the planet which have influence over these uh, metals in the atmosphere and going off of the surface? Okay. It does have more metal to rock than we would expect. 
its magnetic field is actually quite a lot weaker than the Earth's field, but it is generating its own magnetic field. Of material that's being lost from the surface, it, it doesn't sub sub sublim if, no, if, if, if you've got the mineral olivine on a planet and you heat it up, you don't get olivine, you don't get turning into olivine molecules, you break yeah. it apart into yeah. silicon and oxygen and magnesium yeah. and you lose it in atomic form. Yeah. If, if that goes on and you've got your atoms of silicon and oxygen, they won't be affected by the magnetic field until they become charged. If they get hit by a cosmic ray or photoionized, so they lose electrons, then they can start interacting with, with the magnetic field. And that's why the, the distribution of species around Mercury in space changes a lot. But it, it's not an incredibly strong magnetic field. It's small and compact. And the dynamic things which go on in Mercury's magnetic field happen more quickly than they do in the Earth's magnetic field, substorms and the like, which is why my magnetospheric colleagues are very keen on seeing Mercury from two places at once when we have two satellites with, with magnetometers. So it's a, it's a weird place, and yeah. we don't understand it, but we will understand it a lot better ten years from now. Does that answer what yeah. you wanted? Yeah. All right, thank you. We've got another online question. Um, okay, so first of all, we've got a question from Bonnie on Twitter who asks, is it possible to detect unbound or free-floating planets through transiting methods? I suppose hypothetically it's possible. However, if you just see the, a dip in the brightness from a star, you have to do an awful lot of quality assurance before you can say it's a planet. And one of the main things that tells you it's a planet is that it comes around regularly. Um, and so you know that it's a planet in orbit around a star. If it was free floating and just happened to get in the way, then you would, you would just put it down as a glitch in the data because there's no way to follow it up. Um, so there are ways to detect free-floating planets, and they, they actually have been detected, um, but not through transits, as far as I know. This is also a question to you, Karen, from Karen Martin on live stream. Is the proximity of the small red star to the near-Earth-sized near star contributing gravitational heating to the small red star, enabling it to sustain its nuclear fusion? So that's a, that's a really good question, mm -hmm. and that is a question that, that we have sort of thought about at about that um, level of detail. So um, as the star swings by, uh, the, um, the, the sun-like star, it will experience a lot of stresses, and the structure of the star will change in response to those stresses. And it, it probably will actually um, change the amount of nuclear fusion that's going on at the center because the star's structure is changing. So this is something that we really want to look into, but we haven't got very far along that route yet. Um, so it's, it's a very good question and one that we'd like to one that we'd like to explore. Thank you. It's great getting online questions as well, but it stops me paying attention to hands up in the room. So I think we've got one back there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Roger. I live down in Henlow. Um, and in fact, I was one of David's students back in the early 90s. Thank you for that. Um, but my question is on exoplanets. One of the main things for life is protection against solar winds. And for that, you need magnetic fields. Is there any way you can detect the magnetic fields on exoplanets? Well, there's certainly been lots of papers written about detecting magnetic fields on exoplanets. And in fact, um, my, one of my papers on WASP-12, some of the things that we saw in the data, people immediately said, oh, this is evidence for a magnetic field and there's gas entrained in the magnetic field of the planet and this is causing this particular signature in the transit light curve. And I was actually off on extended sick leave when all this was going on and I came back to work and thought, oh, is that really what you made of it all? Because I thought it was just noise in the data. <laughs> and in fact, it, it, it proved to be noise in the data. So hypothetically, you can detect 
the magnetic field through a number of ways. Um, and there have been detections of the magnetic field in the outer atmosphere of the star responding to a close-in planet orbiting around it, but actually detecting the planet magnetic field I'm not convinced we've done that yet, but there are various ways we could do it with bigger and better telescopes and more data. But in terms of life, we don't look necessarily for protection by a planet's magnetic field because in this solar system, we're considering life below the ice inside icy bodies like Europa or Enceladus. So once you're below a carapace of ice, if you've got some warmth, you can have life which depends on chemical energy, not on sunlight. So most of the habitable niches in the entire galaxy could be on icy worlds underneath the ice. But we wouldn't know that. <laughs> no, we wouldn't. But, but maybe the galaxy is full of microbes and not chatty people like Carol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, I do think that probably there is life on other planets, but it probably is microbes rather than yeah, rather than ladies with mini skirts that Captain Cook, uh, Captain <laughs> Kirk bumped Captain into. Cook. Captain Cook. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Sorry, I'm being cheeky asking another one. Um, I'd like to ask Carol, actually, with the discovery of uh, water on exoplanets for the first time, um, what's, what, what's your take on it? How much of your focus is going to be on that in the future? So I think, I think the discovery of water on exoplanets is a bit like the discovery of water on Mars. <laughs> it's, it happens for the first time quite often. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think... I think water is actually a very, very common molecule in the universe. Um, and I think water is obviously very interesting and very important for life. Um, so it is one of the molecules that the aerial mission, which I'm very heavily involved in now, um, will be looking for in a sample of about 1,000 exoplanets. But I wouldn't say that I'm particularly focusing on water at this point. I'm kind of interested in in the sort of the geology of these mass losing rocky bodies that's that's my current sort of favorite geeky pastime so <laughs> i'm i'm leaving water to other people can i sell you a copy of teach yourself geology carol <laughs> <laughs> you could give me i'll give you one you can <laughs> <laughs> i was going i was going to suggest you could give me tutorials <laughs> and once you got some water then you can call the biologists and we'll chip in as well. <laughs> I do love the fact that some of this science starts to really get interesting as all these boundaries intersect. Mm. It's great having a STEM faculty that covers all, all bases here. Yeah. Helen's got a couple. Want a couple online. So this is probably one for Dave from Helene Campoy. Um, do you think AI advances will impact on astronomy and planetary science? Well, it's one for both of us, isn't it? If we're sending probes out, the more autonomous they can be in situ, the better job they will be. I mean, the argument for sending humans to Mars is, is fragile because it's very expensive and it's quite high risk, but we don't mind robots dying when, when they go there. Uh, but a human geologist can accomplish so much more in a half hour field excursion than a remote control rover can. So I think AI in terms of planetary exploration in this solar system is going to be very important. I mean, but surely AI is useful in astronomy as well for analysis of data or something. Yeah, I mean, astronomy almost by definition works with enormous amounts of data. Um, and in fact, several of my last PhD students have gone on to become data scientists working in, in the commercial world. And we've got, we've got big grants here at the Open University led by astrophysicists to do AI-type AI applications. So it's, it's something that's already important. And uh, it's increasingly um, something that you see in results that are coming out in the in the astronomical literature, that there's been an AI analysis component to it. And we've got another online question as well. Yeah, so this one's coming from Zig on Twitter. Um, two for the price of one, actually, here. Mm -hmm. And he congratulates you both on awesome presentations. Yeah. Um, so 
Firstly, is there any way to search for exoplanets using amateur-sized telescopes? Um, and also, is it possible that Mercury could leave its orbit and would it change the other planets' orbits as well? Okay, should I answer the first one? <laughs> so, yes, absolutely, it is possible to find exoplanets using amateur-sized telescopes. Um, so, you know, the whole WASP project is using, you know, camera lenses, which are, you know, they're only about this this much across. So actually quite a lot of serious amateur astronomers have telescopes bigger than that and they can detect transiting exoplanets of the size of Jupiter and, and slightly smaller. Um, one of the ways that amateurs can really contribute is on following up transiting exoplanets that we've already found because there's some interesting science in measuring the exact timing of the transits because a lot of these very close orbiting planets, the orbit is actually decaying. So if you can measure exactly when it comes round each time over a period of years to decades, you can actually learn how the, uh, the planet's orbit is changing. So there's a lot of work that amateur astronomers are doing and can do in that field. Okay, and could Mercury leave its orbit? Um, planetary orbits run almost but not quite like clockwork. Simulations show that orbits of the present planets are stable on timescales of hundreds of millions of years before chaos sets in. But we're not looking at Mercury leaving its orbit. But go back to the birth of the solar system when there was more gas around, so gas drag and orbits have yet to settle down. Mercury probably started further from the sun than it now is. This is a possible solution to the enigma of how it can have lost a lot of rock and yet still be rich enough to volatiles to have explosive volcanism and these hollows forming. If it started further from the sun, it would have had more volatiles to begin with. It could have migrated inwards and on the way in collided with something which would later become the Earth or Venus, being stripped of its rock, but the rock that survived still had a high volatile burden. And then it settled into its present orbit which is now stable, that's not going to fly out of that orbit. And if it did, it's quite a small body, so it would, wouldn't perturb the other planets very much anyway. But in the past, orbital migration is very important. It's probably how we get these hot Jupiters. These close in, easier to find exoplanets, didn't begin there. They started further out and worked their way inwards, almost certainly. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> almost certainly. <Yeah. laughs> like saying it's quite interesting is it is it is it that almost certainly i mean you both sounded pretty confident to me <laughs> we're always prepared to be proved wrong I think that's why we're scientists absolutely <laughs> yeah. well i happen i happen to know that one of our colleagues in maths has written a paper about in situ formation of hot jupiters okay there's there's room for other mechanisms interesting debate continues uh, we've got yeah why not <laughs> uh, Apologise for being greedy and having a second question, mm. but it, it just occurred to me that um, you're talking about the geology you're trying to detect. Uh, uh, the Be I believe Bepi Colombo was due to, when it f was first formed, to have a, a lander. Yeah. Um, and that was cancelled, presumably for costs. Um, is, is that for you a big loss, or do you think it's not really necessary? Um, I don't regret Bepi Colombo not having a lander because it's a very well equipped pair of orbiters and that will do a good job. Bepi Colombo was actually planned about the same time as Messenger, NASA's mission was planned. And it would have been very premature to try and land on the planet, of which we'd only seen half of previously by the Mariner flybys. It was dropped because of cost. There are, is now a proposal. Um, by a um, worldwide group of scientists suggesting that the next mission to Mercury should be a lander, and that's the right time to try. But where do you put down? A lander gives you measurements, wonderful measurements at one spot. Do you go on to uh, the hollows? If so, do you land inside or outside? Do you go to the poles where there's water in the permanently shadowed craters? Do you go to one of these volcanoes? Do you go to young volcanic plains? Where do you put your one lander down? Mm -hmm. it's, ve it's very tricky. <laughs> So there's a question back there and there was an, and another one there and that young lady there is waiting as well. If you can get the mics in those directions, thank you. 
Hi, I was wondering whether the um, political event that shall not be named <laughs> is going to have any uh, impact on your funding and collaboration across Europe. I think, I think that scientists collaborate with each other largely because they've got interests in common, so I'm sure the collaborations will continue. However, a lot of our potential funding routes are going to be curtailed, and so that's obviously going to affect how much we can do if those funding routes are not replaced. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. It's, it's a worrying time. Good question. So, Girl in red. the young lady with the pink cardigan there. <laughs> um, is there a way to find out how old the planets are? Way to find out how, you say how hot? How old. How old. Uh -huh. um, Yes, there is. Um, the oldest bits of rock in the solar system are, uh, are meteorites. The majority of meteorites have not been subject to any process since they formed, and we can date them by radioactivity. And they are about 4.56, very easy number to remember, 4.56 billion years old. So that's when we think the material, the, the gas around the sun, as it cooled down, condensed to form these rocky minerals. 4.56 billion years ago. And the planets formed pretty quickly. Once it, once it started, the planetary formation process was over within 10 or 20 million years, and then they just shuffled around <laughs> in their orbits for a bit. I love the <laughs> geologist's concept of time. <laughs> 10 or 20 million years, pretty quick. <laughs> so for, for exoplanets, um, we, we just assume generally that the planet is as old as the star is, and we can measure the ages of stars very accurately. So a typical measurement might be something like four giga years, four, that's four billion years plus or minus two billion years. So um, <laughs> we, have, we have quite large uncertainties on the ages of typical exoplanets. But if you happen to find one that's very, very young, it actually shines because it's collapsing and releasing gravitational energy. So if you, if you catch one in these first few million years, you can actually work out how old it is reasonably precisely, you know, to, you know, like a tenth of a million years. Great question. There's, there's a gentleman there at the back, and then I think, if we haven't got any more online, I think that brings us to our close. Hi there. Um, yeah, I've heard that uh, life on Earth would be very different without the moon, and I wondered if you'd found any moons around your exoplanets, and whether their particular relationship with those planets might um, say something about their life there, <laughs> possibility of life. Uh, yeah, so, so the planets I've been focusing on are all very, very close to their stars, and so they're quite hot and not really good prospects for life. And... They're also not good prospects for moons because you can't actually fit a moon in a stable orbit if the planet is very close to the star. If I broaden my scope to the whole of what exoplanet astrophysics knows, there has been one possible claim of an exomoon, which is about the size of Neptune orbiting a, a larger gas giant planet. Um, and that was discovered by the transit technique. So there's a transit as the planet crosses the star, and then there's another dip, um, which is sort of following um, the, the orbit of the planet. Now, it's a very long period planet, so we need to go back and check to see if subsequent transits also show this additional signature due to the possible moon. So there's a current controversy in the astronomical journals with some people saying, I analyzed this data and I found a moon, and some other people saying, I analyzed the same data in a slightly different way, and I don't think it is a moon, so we have to, we have to wait to see. But just as there are more planets than stars, there are probably more moons than planets. That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> Almost certainly probably true. <laughs> Very likely to be probably true. <laughs> <laughs> and
ending on that note, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks so much, Carol and Dave. Mm -hmm. We hope you have enjoyed this video and for more videos go to freakphysics.com.